As part of their enduring commitment to justice, equity, and expression, the Open Society Foundations are proud to sponsor Many Lumens. You're listening to Many Lumens, where we talk about and find meaning in the intersections of art, social change, and popular culture. I'm your host, Mayori Carmel Holmes. In this episode, I'm speaking with Telfar Clemens and Babak Radboy, the principal forces behind the iconic Telfar fashion label. Clemens, raised between Queens, Liberia, and PG County, Maryland, started the label in the early aughts while he studied accounting during the day. Radboy, raised between Tehran and Seattle, started his career in the first dot-com boom and then spent several years in various creative pursuits. The two eventually connected and Radboy became creative director of Telfar in 2013. In our conversation, we speak on the organic nature of their creative partnership and how they've been able to navigate the fashion industry together. We touch upon the militarized nature of the field and how they've actively worked to build practices of divestment. And finally, we discuss other projects they have in the works, namely that of building out Telfar TV and potentially a Telfar physical space that, quote, might not be what you think, unquote. Now for my conversation with Telfar Clemens and Babak Radboy. So Babak, I think I remember correctly that you're an Aquarius, right? That's true. <laughs> Telfar, what's your sign? I'm just curious about your dynamic together. Um, I am the first day. I'm the last day of Capricorn, first day of Aquarius. So oh. I'm on the cusp. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, I consider myself an Aquarius more than a Capricorn, but then I'm not as wild as I would wish I was. <laughs> <laughs> we are lousy with Aquarians. <laughs> Everyone's an Aquarius. <laughs> really? <laughs> Basically. Yeah, a lot of people on our team are the same, kind of like. Wow. Between January and February. But then a lot of people are also like July. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Leo's. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Which is, isn't Leo the opposite of Aquarius? It's like the <laughs> direct counter, I think. <laughs> no, yeah, it's, 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 it's supposed, I don't know. Like I have uh, hot Leo friends that I've had, <laughs> you know, and we, it's like a really good pairing. Yeah. Supposedly, you know. Mm. You're both, you know, sort of so-called third culture kids growing up in between and not quite of world, I imagined. And I was wondering if you bond because of this. Yeah, <laughs> totally. First generation. Yeah, we, we, we're we definitely similar a lot in how we grew up. It gives you a certain relationship to your environment because you're just not from there. And also not from and here. And also not China. from here. Yeah. 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 So it's like a little bit of an other and yeah. a third and, a, you know, a bit of an outsider, outsider's view, but also to really inside because I could kind of go anywhere and still feel equally. <laughs> <Out of place. laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it adds to your character. Yeah. Well, I imagine it also gives you particular superpowers and observation and maybe even at some point mimicry, if you were interested in that. I'm curious if it's impacted, how it's impacted your approach toward work. Mm, You mean not wanting to work ever again? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, Beyonce. (laughs) No, I mean, like, like your work, work ethic is like almost like, uh, you know, it's like you have a different kind of like meaning behind the things that you do and getting the chance to do exactly what you want to do instead of like what was imposed on you mm-hmm. by you coming to this country and your family having to, you know, start over or restart or, you know, like I didn't think whatever I'm doing in my life was whatever was supposed to, you know, be for me or that's what I'm going to do. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, that's what I'm doing, what I like to do. And it turned into like my career. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like before it's like, I I went to school for accounting. It's like there, you know, like I was going to be an accountant with a really cool wardrobe that lives in New York and I would manage people's books and go shopping. That's like (laughs) what I thought was going to be my life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I just didn't know that what I'm doing was going to be like, 
in my mind, that's like, oh no, like you can't make money like that, you know? And it was like figuring that out. It's like, I didn't have any formal training and I didn't want to go to fashion school because anything that I went to school for, I hated, you mm-hmm. know? And I think we have that in common because when I look back over my life, it's like, I work too hard, but at the same time, what I was doing was trying to avoid being put to work, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> Like from right, the very beginning, yeah. I was trying to avoid being put to work, and maybe the you know the immigrant thing just makes you even work more harder like harder at not working. <laughs> yeah, because it's like it's like you can't go back. You're not allowed to make a mistake. You're yeah. not allowed to explore your own joy in life because you need to make it in this country because you need to make it, and you didn't come here for that. And it's it was like you know. It was like you have. I had to go to college because that it was like unheard of to not go to college, you know. Yeah. As an African yeah. person from Maryland, <laughs> like it's like you can't <laughs> not go to college. Your parents are gonna let you not go to college. It's like I'm spending most of my time unlearning the shit that I had to go to college for. Yeah. You know, I'm paying with my life to unlearn the shit that I'm paying for. Mm-hmm. Or supposed to have paid for. It. I still will not pay for school. <laughs> Refuse. <laughs> Refuse. You know, it's like I didn't learn shit. It's like if anything, I I learned how to like tolerate people. Mm-hmm. I learned different types of personalities. I learned how to like fend for my own self against you know like in, in like a verbal kind of way. You yeah. know. And that's about it. And I learned how to, like, you know, hang out and, like, manage while being fucked up. Yeah. You know, and then, like, really well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> how about you, Babak? Did you go to college? And how do you feel about your experience? I was, you know, I started working really young, mostly just because of the timing. Like, I started making, you know, these artistic websites in like 1998, 1999, I was like 14 years old. And at that time, that type of activity was kind of more closely associated with graffiti writing than it was uh, with business. Mm -hmm. You know, when the internet started kicking off, people literally had to hire a (laughs) (laughs) 14-year-old. I started working really young. I moved out really young, 14, 15. I moved out of the house. And then the dot-com bubble burst. I actually had a full scholarship to go to school i hated school Mm. i hated school so much growing up and i was bused to this kind of um golf course gated community and i went to school there that probably added to me hating school Mm -hmm. but i had this image in my mind that college was going to be something different and i really believed that it would be and when i got there i was it was the same thing so uh i had a job offer from fox and i went and worked there and quit school. Something else I actually wanted to ask you a little bit later, but because you both just brought it up, something I've been meditating on for a long time, and I feel like I will for a while, is trying to figure out how to balance working very hard because you feel passionate about something, but not doing that because of like a white supremacist ideal, right? Or, you know, imposter syndrome or, you know, proving in some way. But it's really challenging to find the balance between giving your all or looking, you know, for excellence. And I've been reading about both of your backgrounds and know that you both worked incredibly hard for a really long time, particularly as young people doing multiple jobs, partying hard, you know, like just sort of firing on all cylinders. And there's been such a conversation around rest and everybody of color take a nap. You know what I mean? Just sort of thinking about these ways in which we're trying to right the ship in that way. And there's that quote from Kim Kardashian from a couple months ago that was going around on Instagram where she said, you know, in her mind, (laughs) people don't want to work anymore, you know? And she got a lot of flack for that. But I relate to what she was saying, you know? And I was just curious for Mm -hmm. y'all, like, how do you... You know, you're running a company, so you obviously have deadlines that are real. (laughs) You know, you have Mm -hmm. production deadlines for shipping and all all those kinds of things. Like, where are you finding the balance of taking care of yourselves and, you know, not working as hard as you used to, but also, like, having some rigor with the approach to how you work? I mean, I think that, you know, the way that we're put to work alienates us from how we can even 
discern what is work, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, it's like, I think that it becomes difficult to even talk about work because our material condition is so exploitative Mm -hmm. and we're being put to work to reproduce those conditions, right? So a lot of these discourses around therapy, trauma, and rest, they have a side of them that is it itself reproduces our conditions. Yeah. Right. So it's like resting and taking care of yourself is like, well, it's like the captive maternal, you know, it's like, well, that care is what reproduces the conditions just as much as that work does. Mm -hmm. You know, what we've been trying to do, especially now, because, you know, we, we, we launched Telfar TV. We did like a seven month, experiment and now we're kind of in the second version of that we'll move into a new space Mm -hmm. and one of the things that we did was get rid of all the production apparatus it really took a minute for us to even understand how we got to where we are because so many things have changed so quickly right Mm -hmm. because telfar is three friends you know yeah (laughs) we weren't getting paid for the majority of the time that we did this yeah right so to think about it as a business is incorrect it wasn't a business It was the three of us being able to create time to spend together and to spend with other people. And when it came to all that, you know, well, this has to happen on time and we have to file for TPA and all this kind of stuff, we would hire outside producers. And I feel like on this last leg, we just realized we can't do that anymore Mm. because they're bringing in, you know, whatever their intentions are, this thing from the world that isn't from us. Yeah. You know, this like really militarized and hierarchical thing, even if everybody's cool. Yeah. And then we found that people were becoming exhausted. People were being abused, not in some kind of unique way, but in an absolutely normal way. And so it's like the yeah. question is really like, you know, how do you do it socially? How do you do it in community? Yeah. I mean, you know, for me also, too, is like I wanted to do most of the things that I was doing because I saw that that was missing. That didn't happen. Like, I wanted that to be the thing that I did. <laughs> You know, in the world, like the first person to do it, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And that was the thing that kept driving a lot of the different, you know, goals that I had as a person, as a designer, as a company. And I think that that's still like the thing that, you know, because it was like, like, I'm going to be making some stuff that I want. And usually the stuff that I want isn't around, you know what I mean? That's why I want it. And just making those things and, like, actually seeing those things now, like, on a specific person that wasn't around before. Because that person didn't exist. You know? Because it's like, you can be a designer and make some really cool clothes and they existed. It's like, I didn't want to do that at all. Yeah. Like, and that's been, like, if anything, that's my thing. You know? Like, if it's around... I have no business being around it. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) and that was like really like the main goal of, you know, doing this. And then like, you know, when fashion comes into it and needing money to achieve those things, you know, and having to achieve them on like a seasonal level of like, you know, trying to like almost like please someone else. That's when it started to get out of whack. You know what I mean? Because it's like, the thing that you have to make to be able to be in a showroom and the thing that you have to make to be able to be in a store is not the thing that I wanted to make or the mm-hmm. thing that I was excited about. Yeah. It's like a silk screen t-shirt was the last thing I thought about. And people would tell me that's the first thing you should think about. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> is it? <laughs> you know? And I want to, you know, I want to kind of put a fine point on it because there's like a whole theory here that is under theorized because the people who, theorize are not usually part of mass material flows Mm -hmm. how you on a mass scale circulate an idea that is totemized in an object Mm -hmm. right you know what what you're doing when you make clothes and they're not like clothes that go in a gallery they're purporting to have a people attached to them they're purporting to be the evidence of a material culture of a people even though that people doesn't Mm pre-exist, right? You build a capacity for a certain type of people to come into being. Yeah. And that's the very weird thing about what you, what gets called fashion. It's interesting. I I know um, we're not going to talk too much about 
the bag because you've talked about that a lot. But something that why I was- not? Wait, why not? <laughs> I'm so glad, you know, I mean, also too, you know, I love that fucking bag. I love that bag so fucking much. Like, you know, we, you know, but it's, it's really funny because people are like, wow, you know, I really love your bags. I'm like, we made one style of a, a really yeah. cool bag. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, I guess I'm a bag designer, but I'm like, it's really funny when people are like, they, Clothes, like, I just started making them. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> you yeah. know? Like, I, this year, I just started making clothes. <laughs> you know? Well, something that occurred to me with the bag that I wanted to just bring up, and Telfar, I know you spent some time in the suburbs, but Bak, I don't know if you were in the Seattle suburbs or if you were in um, an urban environment, but when I was younger, I hung out at the mall, right? Like, and it was like the place that that was all over. I went to high school in Atlanta and people from all over the city would kind of meet up at the mall. That was like where youth culture mm-hmm. was. And yeah. I think about being 13 or 14, not really having any money and like trying to get the biggest shopping bag I could from like J. Crew or Gap or the polo store. And I would walk around with that bag and be so like excited. And it kind of occurred to me that that sense of belonging of like having that shopping bag is what your bag has done. When I have my Telfar bag, I feel mm. similarly. You know, it's inclusion by way of possession in some ways. And so I was just curious, like, if that was, <laughs> if that had any relationship I mean, to you. I, I come from, I am so, it's like, when I think of fashion, that's like, literally, like, it's like, I come from mall culture, yeah. you know? If anything, it's like, I know a bit too much about, <laughs> about it, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's like, you know, the touch and the feel of certain things that are mid-level. Mm-hmm. It's like, mm-hmm. to achieve that on a small level is the hard, hard, hardest, most like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, because it's just like, it's like, that's made in like a mass kind of way. Yeah. And, you know, for you to make one of that is almost like so backwards, you know, and actually like a weird version of it or like an irregular version of it is like crazy. Yeah. You know? so, and it's also just like the attainability. It's like I use leggings as the perfect example. Leggings and heels, actually, at the height of like when you think of heels that people wear that were like six inches. It's like you couldn't you can't find a pant that's not a legging actually <laughs> in the mall yeah and you can't find a shoe that's lower than six inches yeah in the mall you know what i mean you don't have a choice but to look like that you yeah. know what i mean and that's just what people look like yeah so yeah. it's like really like if it's around like you're gonna look like that <laughs> you know <laughs> There's also this other thing, though, when you talk about like this kind of mid-level achievability, because I think about, you know, one of your partners, Converse, right? Like you think about a Chuck Taylor um, Mm -hmm. for the last 50 years, (laughs) you know, being this like both affordable, but also super iconic and mark of cool, even though everybody can own them. Right. But there's something still so cool about, you know, having that. And I. It, you have achieved something similarly, and it's kind of, it's really incredible. Uh, you know, I feel like that was the vibe from the very beginning, and that is what inspired, like, the the infrastructure of fashion to conspire against Telfar, mm. right? The message was not, like, niche. The message was hegemonic. But, yeah, that's, it's like this, is that has always been this play on hegemony, you mm-hmm. know, which is a play on power. Even if it was incredibly niche and totally irregular, the base material was always about mass, always about like that mall, you know? Yeah. Where and it's something like, becomes part of the environment. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I also too, you know, it's like I I would see things in like a certain way and I noticed that after I would make a thing, things started looking like the thing. And it kept happening for years and years and years and years, and years until things just needed to actually like I'm like that means that that's my thing. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> it's like nobody looked like that before I looked like that. You know mm-hmm. what I mean. So it was like really like constantly trying to keep up with a thing and having your name on it before someone else. You know, and you and like you know showing this thing that I like to to a store for them to buy it. They saw it ten times and then go to Europe two years later and buy the same thing. 
would drive me nuts, you know? So it was like this thing of like, really like it, it had to happen, you know? Can we talk a little bit about your political formation? Sort of what has shaped your understanding of power in the world? Well, uh, you know, just to, to, just to, to maybe introduce the question, like, I think that the thing that Telfar and I have in common might actually be a certain type of resistance to politics mm-hmm. as a frame for what we're even talking about. <laughs> like we haven't, we don't talk directly about a lot of certain types of things. Mm-hmm. And maybe we increasingly have tried to discern where it's necessary to talk about something and to turn something into speech. But let's say the question is very different for each of us because these things I have a different engagement with them, even if we both end up always moving in the same direction. Yeah, I'm increasingly uh, distrusting about everything political. (laughs) And I try to really make my mind up for myself by my experience of the thing, whether it's little or a lot. Yeah. (laughs) Is is how I'm kind of navigating things. One of the things that I feel like I'm always investigating working in film space is, you know, how we undo, how militarized that space is, right? And I Mm -hmm. imagine that fashion is a similarly (laughs) militarized space. Mm -hmm. And you you work to undo that or, you know, sort of to say decolonize. I know we're trying to find a different way to say that, but how do you sort of undo that training and that assembly line? And still mm-hmm. accomplish, you know, your goals within it, but also at the same time creating something new, right? It's 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 a mm-hmm. double project, or even more than yeah. double. Um, so I yeah, don't know. I it's like yeah, I don't know. Like I think like it's really about living it right now and figuring it out as mm-hmm. you do it, and also to not putting that mission statement on in myself. Period. Mm-hmm. To even try to undo anything, but just knowing what you feel about mm-hmm. how you perceive stuff. I mean, it's like, the thing is, is, you know, if you're to apply, okay, if you're to apply a political analysis to what we do, like it's extremely political because the types of practices that we're developing are um, forms of resistance to how we're being put to work, how we're being mobilized. But like a practice, you could have a political statement in a discursive sense and still repeat the exact same practices that kind of betray it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like whether or not you formulate it as language is not, you know, the most important thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's more it's more the effect of the thing in the world that you're trying to build. Do either of you look at this work that you're doing together? with the brand or the label. I'm not sure how you prefer to refer to it, but do you see that as activism? I hate that word. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm actively, <laughs> like, actively against maybe that, but, you know, it's up to people to view and say whatever they want to say, but I don't... I, don't I would put that. it this way. When you say activism, are we talking about an extracurricular or a career? Mm. And that's the problem. You know what I mean? Because what we're trying to do is establish a different way of life. Mm -hmm. Like in our actual practices (laughs) Mm -hmm. and to share that, Mm -hmm. to make that like, it's not, if we can't share, like we can't have anything alone. Yeah. There isn't really much for you to buy. Like, what are you going to buy? They got cars, you know, (laughs) like it's like, so (laughs) if this is going to be worth anything, it's about how you actually live. And you can't yeah. live without being able to share it. So you have a type of social practice that becomes absolutely yeah. necessary to your survival. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also, too, you know, it's like there's things bigger than, like, things that we sell that I think people are getting from us. You know what I mean? It's like if you act in a certain way or know a certain type of person that this is now, that wears this thing that looks like that, that speaks like that, that like, that's a bigger fucking thing. Mm -hmm. That's huge. (laughs) You know what I mean? You know, and it's like, I want to keep exchanging different things like that, like hairstyles. This, you know, like when you look like me (laughs) and we're saying the same thing, that's bigger, you know? And, And if that's activism, then cool. 
you know. <laughs> <laughs> I would interject also to say that, you know, that's, it's like there's Telfar with the capital letters. There's Telfar as the individual, you know. You know, I'm not really interested in individuating myself, but like the way that I've engaged in our collective, you know, has different forces that kind of push it, that come from my own kind of family, my own uh, need to have some kind of space to live in, <laughs> in the world, you know? Yeah. You know, I would say that what drives me, you know, my father was a gorilla. I was born underground in Iran and I was kind of raised in that reality you know like we didn't have furniture in our house because we might leave mm. the way that the environment was presented to me as a child was like being behind enemy lines and so i always had this relationship to to the environment um as something that's kind of predatory and the way that predation is not just like exteriorized or as i grew i realized that predation can't be exteriorized into something that you can call capitalism and separate from all the rest of life, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the people who are thriving, you know, like the people are maintaining their own captivity, let's say, right? And you have like a, a certain history of struggle. It's like a history with, you know, movements and battles and politics and parties. And it's also a history of consciousness. You know, I feel like that that is what we are kind of contributing to in how we try to practice within the confines that kind of, you know, are presented to us. I want to I want to ask you both about your motto for the label uh, that Telfar is not for you, for everyone. You know, how does that exhibit the, the ethos of, of what Telfar is? contradictory <laughs> yeah i think it's it's exactly that you know and it's also just like i love i love you know but it's, it's not for you <laughs> he loves the first part <laughs> you know but that's the thing that that okay you know first of all we wouldn't have made a motto to begin with unless we had to right mm -hmm. so we were already <laughs> in a state where um, we couldn't leave well enough alone. Like our survival <laughs> was at stake and there were certain forces that were kind of, you know, creating that, that were at the end of the day, some of them were discursive forces. Right? Mm -hmm. Not all of them. And so that's why we had a motto to begin with. But the type of motto that we made is like, that's a question. Like that's not, it can't really be answered and it's not supposed to be answered. It's supposed to be generative. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have like, like an aesthetic proposition that fucks with hegemony the way that Telfar's does. And you have the idea of like, let's say something like the Benetton Gap neoliberal world that becomes flattened and globalized uh, around mm -hmm. the kind of cult of the individual, right? And then you have that statement. <laughs> you know, it starts, it, you know, you have to question both like who you is supposed to be uh, yeah, and yeah, and just, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it's the most ambiguous statement that you don't know where you stand in it. And I love that place, you know, it's like, it's like is, it, is it not for you? Or are you everyone? But Bach, in some of the research that we were doing, you previously described the Telfar customer as a, quote, black adjacent, queer adjacent person who wasn't typically found in fashion advertising. And of course, this was a couple years ago and the landscape for fashion and culture has changed quite a bit. And I'm curious if the Telfar customer or audience, in your opinion, has also shifted. Well, I would repeat that if I was in an interview, <laughs> it was under duress. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know, I would qualify that because it's like in that interview format, you can't really say what you mean. Mm -hmm. And like, I think what Telfar said earlier is really instructive. Okay, I would just say in general, when we talk about a people, there's a tendency to think of that as a still life mm -hmm. or like a stilled life. Yeah. Where you get into this idea of demographics, like people just exist. If you're a politician, you formulate your policy to appeal to these different demographics that already exist. Mm -hmm. I think in actual fact, people are being created by the way that they're being spoken to. 
so that the Telfar customer did not pre-exist. The Telfar customer came into existence with the space that was created for this person. Yeah, because it's like, I, I honestly don't see a person that I can't trust. I don't know, you know? And I try, I, I ask the question and then also too, I don't think about it too much. You know, when people are like, oh, that's not for me. It's like, well, uh, you have two arms and two legs <laughs> and a waist <laughs> and a neck. And you have an ear, right? You have some ears. I could dress you, you know? It's like, it's more intimidating than it actually is. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like not up for me to make you feel comfortable because I, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I'm, you know, I'm not catering anymore, you know? I want to shift just slightly and talk about you both have this ongoing encounter with the capital A art world. You know, so many of your friends are working artists. You've been engaged in experimental film and video. I know some of my favorites, Tyree Chapeau, Leila Wanra, Terrence, Nance, of course. You've collaborated with them. How is Telfar, capital letters, the, the company, engaged with contemporary art? Through friendship, just that part of it. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think mostly through friendship these days and through support <clears throat> of those friends. That's where it's mostly lied, you know, because that's that's what's pushed certain things, you know, that we're involved with in a certain direction because it's like, you know, we're in that space because we like that person, mm -hmm. not necessarily because we want to be in that space. There's a lot of people who who's like potentials, they're already like crushed, right? And the art world is a space where it's like there's a certain economic relationship that crushes social potential. Mm -hmm. And then there's a absolute top tier of the richest people on earth that appropriate that potential so that it doesn't turn into revolutionary uh, discontent. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's like a type of ransom that's being paid to artists um, because of the fact that they cannot, like already before they begin, have a social effect on their world. You mm -hmm. know, and I'm not trying to put them down. You know, people have to survive and like, and also th there is communications that come through, but the material conditions have become so stark, you know, and the discourse has not caught up. Seen is a journal of film and visual culture focused on black, brown, and indigenous communities globally. Subscribe today and receive two beautifully designed issues a year featuring essays, reviews, interviews, and more from critics, artists, and other luminaries of color. Learn more at scene.blackstarfest.org. You're listening to Many Lumens, and now back to my conversation with Telfar Clemens and Babak Ratboy. I would be remiss not to ask you all about our missing a uh, crucial element to the kind of Voltron force that is Telfar, and that is Avina Gallagher. Could you both talk <laughs> yeah. about what she brings to Telfar and how you each met her? I met Avina when I'm just on the street. <laughs> like We used to hang out in like the same park. Even, I didn't know what a stylist was before I met her, really. Mm -hmm. You know, or like what they did. <laughs> you know? Like, after after just like hanging out and like kind of seeing each other just like, as friends, you know, like like literally we'll see each other every day. Like we have like, you know, people would run into each other every single day. And that's like how we became friends. And I think like, you know, professionally, I guess like the first time I did a show, she and Lauren Boyle like helped me like put it together. We like put on this show. And like since then that's like, you know, that's the person I trust to, like, you know, I show the, her sketches, like, before a thing happens and talk about what it's supposed to be. As much as, like, what Telfar is as me is, like, so much her, too, because mm -hmm. she's, like, this thing. That's the thing that we meant to do. And it's, like, you know, it was done so much together that it's, like, you know, we have a language that we speak. I mean, I think it's, like, it comes down to the question of, like, what, what you can legitimately even speak about if you speak about fashion or style. 
And I think that mm-hmm. Telfar and Avina <laughs> have a much more expansive view of what that is. Like who on the street actually looks good, you know? And what constitutes this, what is even legible within the field, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. So it's like this, like, you know, this old Filipino grandpa that has a bundle of napkins safety pinned to the front of his wife's feet. That's fashion. <laughs> I mean, it also, too, it's a set of experiences. It's like we, again, she's similar background and growing up, like, and, you know, experiences with being here, experiences of knowing your culture and how your people and your family dresses and their family dress. And, you know, like, it's the same person, you know, like, when you boil, when we boil it down, it's like really like, yeah, your grandma has that thing, too. And you guys have that kind of blanket. And it's a set of experience that create what the fashion is that we're, that we, you know, it's like, even when we travel, it's like the same person that we see. It's like, it's like we won't even be together and show, show each other like a picture of like someone that we saw in, you know, like it's, it's, it's like, it's a connection that's like, you know, it's like, I don't think I could work with anyone. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> that, that's like literally how I feel about it. It's like really like I don't I don't really know how to do that thing if that person is not around to actually you know like understand. It's like I'm not working with another stylist because they don't get it. There there seems to be a great deal of intimacy and care in your partnership, and I wanted to know how do you strike the balance of you know doing things in an unconventional manner and in a collaborative manner, but also still leading you know, and being clear about vision. You know, as I I came into the company, you know, like in 2013, a lot of my focus has been on the, you could say the shows, but then you have to broaden what that means now because we don't do that anymore. We have a TV channel. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But it was like kind of how do you take that, that, um, that like non-coercive, non-extractive, like that like real open, like creating a space for capacity to form and 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 start to sometimes you have to do it fast right so how do you start turning it into a set of practices that can be scaled Mm -hmm. to some degree Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a lot of what has gotten us to where we are at this point um, because those things are not stagecraft they end up being really how you have to be all the time it's like leadership is like a weird word for it, you know, because it's like how, you know, Gaddafi never actually had a position in the Libyan government. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like there's something about like legitim- like like legitimacy mm-hmm. that itself is problematic. And like, you know, you start to realize because first because you were forced into it because nobody took you seriously or listened to you you realize that, oh, wait, there's a certain advantage to this. I can use this. It's like the kind of the science of, like, illegitimate power, you know? (laughs) Which is always going to be revolutionary, though. But it's like, oh, who's in charge here? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's like, you don't have to go to the office. You can just go in. I'm like, yeah, you can just go in. It's like, Uh you can do anything you want. And what I want is for you to do anything you want. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and so you better yeah. do it. Yeah, I hate that whole thing of, you know, this, like, respect and boss. And, like, you know, it just makes for a really, you know, not saying that we don't, you know, like, I love designing the clothes. I do the clothes, you know. Like, I wouldn't want someone else to do them because it just wouldn't make sense. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But at the same time, it's like, I'm like, I'm open to knowing about shit, you know, and working with people. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, you know, but I hate, I, I, I never had a job, really. And usually if I have a job, I'm like, really, like, it's supposed to end at a certain point. You know, mm-hmm. in time, <laughs> you know, like, I don't want to be there like 10 years, you know, like, it, and I want other people to feel like that. Whereas, like, it's your thing. That's your life's work. That's what you do, you know. Yeah. And it's enjoyable. It's not like, you know, like you're beholden to like a certain thing or career. Yeah. Or you retire. You know, I feel like I'm retired already, you know? 
And, and so, like, this goes back to the question of just, like, how we're trying to work and not work in general, mm -hmm. which is that if you think about extractive practices and coercive practices, they all, they have, like, a kind of historiography where they have to start after you take everything away from someone, right? So that they need to work to have anything, including to have time, which is something that people are supposed to have, <laughs> right? So, like, the extractive practices, you know, are seen as profitable practices, but they're actually completely based on scarcity, and they suffer from a total poverty of means because you're just tiring people out. So, like, a lot of the question becomes, like, how do you tap into the actually existing abundance? Like, there's a complete abundance that is already there before it's, you know, before it's disciplined and extracted from. Yeah, also too, you know, the reward of what you get from a thing, like, you know. <laughs> it's like, I think about that, it's like, okay, you do a fashion show and you're staying up, like, for a month straight and do all this stuff for, like, 10 minutes, and what the fuck did you get after that? Mm -hmm. You know? Like, what did you get after that? What was the effect of that experience? And it's like really like a question I constantly am just like, what what happened? And it's like, usually I feel really good. And mm -hmm. like, I'm like, damn, we just did something that like went around the world, changed a certain mood of what is going to happen later. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it's like, if fashion isn't like deeply rewarding in that sense. Like, if it's, you know what I mean? That is the just system like, that we were in. You so need to have a lot of fucking fun. Like, you better run up that hotel bill to the top of the top. You know what I mean? Because like, the shit is not fun. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, you actually need, like, and that was the thing I learned from Italy. It's like, no, you need yeah. to actually be in the best place. Feel the best. Like, it's like, that changes the whole mood of why you're even doing it. You know what I mean? It's like, and literally just thinking like that, it's like, literally, if you made the best shirt in the world, you need a house in return for that best shirt in the world, you know? <laughs> Otherwise, it's like, why did you do it? Right. <laughs> you know? Unless you really wanted to wear that shirt. A question for you in this, you know, approach. I'm just curious if you had any kind of, like, guiding lights or examples that, you know, maybe they weren't exactly what you've created, but how did you, you know, even get to this different way of being? I mean, it's like living, living it and going through that process and like constantly like kind of perfecting and growing from the work that you created is like, you know, again, the bag, it's like, you know, been improving this one thing that actually has gone everywhere, you know what I mean? And it's continuing to like have this like life because we spent the time to do it you know what i mean it wasn't like overnight and you just did it and that's it you know it's like constantly perfecting like your craft and what you're putting out and figuring out why you're putting it out. so you really actually have to like what you're you know what i mean yeah like actually that's like it. it you mentioned you mentioned italy and that was you know that was like the kind of everything was kind of working up towards that in a way and that is where we met terence for the first time Mm. I mean, I would answer the question a little differently because I feel like in terms of, you know, like the, the practice of making clothing, um, there was, it's like you could make the best thing in the world, but if your energy is being captured at every single joint, uh, yeah. then you're going to be depleted, right? So, you know, like I, like my my experience of working together has been a little bit, um, even though it's not, but it, there's like a certain remove from it where I always felt like I was a witness as well as a participant. And what I was witnessing was like really violent. And, you know, I was, I think, more worried all the time <laughs> as we were working together um, and, and learning from what was happening to us, right? Like the first 10 years of Telfar, there was like a type of erasure. I wouldn't say it's a lack of recognition. I would say it was an erasure. It was that this is not a thing and it isn't happening. And that was 10 years of work. Mm. 
Mm. And 10 years in which, you know, the work continuously improved and not just improved, but just like went through all kinds of beautiful mutations and pushed itself forward under, you know, I think that the the thing that just was itself and was like, like uh, the, the, the environment around it shifted uh, in really particular ways around like the election of Donald Trump um, and this like desire from like the kind of vessels of communication to, to to mobilize this narrative of inclusion and diversity as a type of supplication for the for the the violent increase <laughs> of violence you know to bodies and we found like things were starting to shift like people were you know we went from being marginalized to being kind of tokenized in that moment instead of thinking of that as an opportunity we reacted to it as a kind of existential threat Mm -hmm. right (laughs) it's like oh shit now we're in trouble right because we're exploitable so in the years that followed like immediately you know after the our kind of first recognition with the cfda awards it's like we really moved into a different way of doing shows as a type of like technology of of being together socially of improvisation and of you know a type of like an aesthetic sociality where we would we would do these shows that like were um you know truly improvised like coming together under like conditions of extreme freedom for all the artists involved in them they were really different you know and they started getting a lot of attention but what we were doing was like developing an entire way of being together um and and a type of research almost because even as we did those shows and we carried on how we were doing, those shows were being mobilized and interpreted as further evidence of the inclusivity and diversity of mm-hmm. the system, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it kept, you know, it, it's a crazy feeling when you do a show and you love it, and then you get a really good review and you read the review and it makes you want to throw up because who's doing the review, you know? Like nothing is changing. Um, you're just being mobilized so that people can keep their position, you know, because they now have the correct opinion about you. <laughs> but, they, but they have a very yeah. clear idea of what they're going to do with you, which is that they're going to own you. Right. right? But all of these quote unquote, like for us, the dirtiest word is opportunity, mm-hmm. you know, right. because every opportunity is an opportunity to be exploited. Yeah. And, you know, like, I feel like Italy was like the kind of, like the end point, the termination point of a certain way of thinking for us, like the most, the ultimate expression of a certain type of practice. And it coincided with a year long plan um, that was not just aesthetic, but was material Mm -hmm. to leave the system. Mm -hmm. So we moved from, we moved into a mode of divestment that we needed to decouple our well being from our exploitability. Mm -hmm. That meant no investors, no licensors, no retailers. We spent the entire budget. We were invited to this uh, this kind of it's like the longest running fashion invitational in Florence for menswear, mm-hmm. uh, and they give you a bunch of money. They have you do a show. It's part of their kind of uh, you know their civic capture of world culture. Is that the Pizzi Omo? Um, Pizzi Omo, yeah. Mm-hmm. And we essentially use that entire budget for the show and put it into a dinner prior to the show, <laughs> right? And flew in everybody we wanted to be with. Mm-hmm. So that's where we met Terrence. That's where we met a bunch of people mm-hmm. and, and a lot of really close friends as well and people whose work we loved and people whose presence we loved. And we all had dinner together and had a party. The table that we ate on was the runway for the next day. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So that the there wasn't... <laughs> It's like you're just getting the scraps because I have an abundance of wine stains, you know? (laughs) And what we really, what was really important already happened and was between us. Last year, you were chosen to design uniforms for the Liberian Olympic team. And I really enjoyed seeing those uniforms. Um, I was like, kind of like, never in my mind in in a wildest time did I think I would see sort of like an athletic version of a boo boo, and mm-hmm. I'm just sort of like curious, how did that collaboration come about, and what did it mean for you, Telfar, 
to represent your country of origin in this way? I was going to Liberia just because I hadn't been and had no me- no real memories of when I was there last mm-hmm. because I left when I was five. So I went back last February and I took my family with me just on a trip. And as I was on my way there, we got an email from Kuti and Matadi wanting to like talk to me about doing uniforms for the Liberian Olympics. So I had already planned this trip to go. And as I was going, we spoke to them. So when I, you know, got on the plane to like you know, go on this trip, I was in my mind like thinking about what, you know, what we were gonna make. And kind of like Liberia is just like the best styled country in the West. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I don't know, just being there and constantly being there. You know, because um, I was just there. It's just like I'm, I'm getting a lot from just just being, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I don't know. I hung out and sketched some stuff and came out with that. There, I, I believe I, I saw this in the research that your grandmother had a sewing school. And I know that your mm-hmm. aunt taught you how to sew. And I was wondering, mm-hmm. um, for me, my paternal grandmother was a seamstress in the Garmin district in LA and my paternal grandfather had uh, run a haberdashery um, in mm-hmm. South Central. And I know that I have a kind of like, uh, I would say kind of like a ancestral connection to fabric and to construction, even though I don't practice mm-hmm. it. And I was wondering if you mm-hmm. also have that. I mean, I think so. Even though like <laughs> my grandma was alive, she was like, I would, so all of your clothes, and we're like, no, we want to buy clothes from the Gap. <laughs> we want to buy clothes from the mall. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, and as soon as she passed away, I ended up starting to sew. And I learned most of my sewing, like, it's like, you know, from just deconstructing stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like I have, you know, an aunt that worked in the fashion industry that would give me fabrics and all these different things. And I would actually cut and sew a lot of the things that I wanted to try mm-hmm. because, you know, one, I couldn't afford to do it. And you can't really tell someone what you want. You just have to try it on in a mirror and keep trying it mm-hmm. until you get the thing that you want. And that's how I went about making clothes, you know? Yeah. And my aunt was really like, you know, you don't sew really well. Like, your sewing's awful. <laughs> like, it's really just like, you know, and like constantly was trying to get me into like going to fashion school. And I was like, no, I'm good. You know, I'll learn the wrong way and learning the wrong way was actually the most valuable way of learning yeah because that's where the new thing came from you all have mentioned earlier and i want to bring it back uh you've launched a television network in collaboration with the umacroma called telfar tv and i mm-hmm. wanted to talk about that what inspired uh telfar tv you know, I, if I was going to say I'm like any kind of artist, I've made a video for every collection that I've made. And I'm obsessed with TV. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I didn't know that the TV network started to develop itself because I was talking about really wanting to like movies, video, you know, like all different things th- of that sort. And, you know, the more we kept talking about it, the more it became apparent that this is what we had to do <laughs> to be able to connect with people on a deeper level, get out of the social media trap that is the internet, you know, being able to think freely and actually and communicate that to people that are like-minded, <laughs> you know, like everything just keeps pointing towards it and, and looking back, backwards just seems old mm-hmm. like you know what i mean how did you all come to work with the umacroma yeah like we wanted to you know if i the, the the idea of tv was happening for a long time before it was even an idea of tv mm-hmm. um, it was just like a kind of um you you could understand like two two things like one is the, that position i described of like reading a good review and wanting to throw up right it's like, no matter what we do, we're going to be mobilized, right? As long as we don't own or disown the narrative and also the, the infrastructure behind it, right? <clears throat> the means of production and distribution. 
which is what we were doing with our clothes, but then we would still be used as like a kind of, you know, icon of like supplication. And so like being able to distribute the message through cinema was like already on the radar. We like our, our, um, and I remember watching random acts of flying. It's like thinking about like, okay, what would a different world, a transmission from a different world look like? Mm-hmm. Then I watched random acts of flying. It's like, all right, this is pretty close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? This is not just a show. It's like a different, it feels like it's, it's coming from a completely different place. Yeah. Mm. Um, and that that place has the possibility of existing because the capacity for it is being built. And then also looking at the credits of the show and looking at the names of who's working on it, I'm like, all right, this is a whole community, mm-hmm. you know? So mm-hmm. that's why we invited Terrence to, to Florence and how mm-hmm. we first met. And I think we mm-hmm. just talked for like over a year, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Terrence talked about how the real dream behind Random Max was a TV channel, a TV network just at the same time as I was saying, Hey, we want to make a TV network. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think like, yeah, I think we weren't, you know, it started too, because also too, like I, like people have been following our story for like probably like the last five years, you know, and we've been planning a movie and it was going to different things and more and more, we wanted to take that into our own hands and not actually share that with like you know like sell it to someone or you know Mm. so it just kept developing and still like again with the shows too it's like you didn't see that show if you didn't go to the show like we haven't posted a show that we've done since 2018 Mm -hmm. so it's like all of this stuff has it has been documented in the form of like a film you know what i mean Mm -hmm. specifically from that time before the world and then and still like right now I'm still documenting it. So, you know, this is an important point and this is really far out. Like far right out. now I'm recording this, you know, so. mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> this is the thing that's really far out. So like right when we were kind of in basically as soon as we realized that we needed to get out of the system, we also got this um, request from a producer to make a documentary about us. Okay. And as we entered into those, you know, and people started following us around with cameras, and then we started entering into like confronting the problematics of what was being done to us mm-hmm. in trying to narrativize us, even with the best intentions. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so like, it's like, oh, you're going to make a movie about us and all we have to do is be ourselves. OK, who are we? What is in this movie? You know what I mean? <laughs> What's the script? Let's sit down and write the script for this movie. Mm-hmm. You know, like what's going to be in this movie about us? And it, it almost like it opened up these these questions around like um, the kind of authority of of a uh, of a documentary and what it says about when when in fact like you know all every way that this world fucks us up is a form of fiction. Yeah, you know, 100%. it's a fiction that people have the luxury to just create to turn into reality. So it's like, how do you create your own fiction? you know, this, this kind of poesis. And, and as we kept, you know, so then we start talking to Terrence about directing the film about us and the question of, well, then what is in this film? You know, eventually it's like, you know what, like the film is going to be live, right? So the TV channel is the film as it's happening. Mm-hmm. And I don't even know if it'll ever coalesce into the type of thing. Cause a film in general is hard to separate. What is a film from a form mm-hmm. of property? Because this world can only deal with film as a form of property, you know? So what's a dispersed film? So like the, the channel, it's like if us getting out of the fashion system was like a first step of divestment from becoming the managers of our own captivity, <laughs> <laughs> um, we took like to heart the type of support that reverberated from that divestment, right? And the type of people that materialized in the space that it made. And we have to use that money to divest further. And that's what the TV channel is. It's like a divestment opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's like, how do you get even further out? You know, how do you create relations that will prefigure and prepare for radical discontinuity? Hmm. I just have two more questions. And one is, 
Is there a brick and mortar Telfar store in the future? Damn. Yeah. Brick and mortar or screen and visual? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Both. Yeah. We're going to be all over. There, there's going to be places for you to buy some shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, also, too, I'm, I'm not putting that pressure on. We're working on it right now, but it might not be what you think. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, hey. Shop.telfar.net. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we just opened an office space in the, you know, obviously with COVID still going on, but there's something like delicious about physical space and seeing people in mm-hmm. person. And I know you have that to some like, extent. Yes. Yeah. Loitering, yeah. like yeah. hanging out, not buying anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All of that. I'm, I'm so obsessed with, and, you know, I keep talking about it and I really, I want it to be the right thing. I think that also too should grow into like our store will be a cultural practice. Mm-hmm. You know, if it could be like the East Village Market on a Saturday in 2007, that's what I want. So <laughs> until that happens, <laughs> you know. My last question for you both is where do you find refuge? <laughs> what does that mean, you know? <laughs> <laughs> refuge. <laughs> I don't know. Friends of him, interaction and conversation, and hot guys. <laughs> Ashe. <laughs> I feel good when we're just messing things up, you know? You know, when we're really moving, you know, when we're doing a thing we're not supposed to do and going to a place that we don't even know where it is and, like, you know, just like, <laughs> thank you both so so much this was this was incredible i'm really happy to have this conversation thank you thank you thank you you. and i hope we get to see you yes same sometime yeah okay Okay, take care thank you (laughs) thank you thank you thank you To find out more about Telfar and Babak's work, you can check them out on Instagram or Twitter at Telfar Global. You can also shop for your new Telfar bag or apparel at shop.telfar.net and check out Telfar TV at telfar.tv. This season of Many Lumens is brought to you by Open Society Foundations. It is produced by Black Star Projects in partnership with Row Home Productions. The host and executive producer of Many Lumens is me, Mayori Carmel Holmes. This episode was produced by Dallas Taylor. Associate producers are Irit Reinheimer and Farah Rahaman. Guest associate producer for this episode is Katie Bagley. Managing producer is Alex Lewis. Executive editor is John Myers. Our music supervisor is David Little Dave Adams, Black Star's music and cinema fellow supported by the Pop Culture Collaborative. Our theme song was composed by Vijay Mohan and remixed by Little Dave. This episode features music by Bus Crates. If you liked what you've heard this season, please leave us a review on Apple Podcast and let us know what you think of the show. Sending you light and see you next season.